morning and welcome everyone. We are all glad to have this opportunity to gather today to sing praises, to hear God's word, and enjoy a virtual fellowship with the BSOP family. Before we start, just a friendly reminder to always mute our... Oh, how we long to meet together and cherish your word together and study together. May you help us overcome this pandemic with wisdom and may your word be always be our comfort and source of strength. Use our speaker today as he delivers to us your word. Also use the songs that we are about to sing to prepare us to hear your message. Please don't let us don't let the limitation of this platform distract us from hearing your word. We entrust to you the whole service. May the Holy Spirit give us understanding as we gaze upon the beauty of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So let us give praise to our God by singing the hymn, uh, My Word is Not in What I Thank God for that uh, wonderful song that uh, perhaps refreshed us uh, for today's uh, chapel service. Our passage uh, uh, for today is found in Romans chapter 1 verse 1 and uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 to 11. Please follow along as I read. Uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. Set apart, set apart uh, for the gospel of God. And Second Peter chapter one verse three to eleven, His divine power, the uh, divine power, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the, divine, of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The title of the, the message uh, is Sealed in His Calling. And our speaker for today is Pastor David C. King. And Pastor David C. King completed his Bachelor of Arts in Psychology at the University of St. LaSalle, his Master's of Divinity at the Biblical Seminary of the Philippines, SOP, and his doc, uh, Doctor of Ministry at Singapore Bible College. He served as uh, he served as a guidance counselor and Bible teacher at, as, at Trinity Christian School. Currently, he is the chairman of the Bacolod Pastors Prayer Fellowship, an interdenominational fellowship of ministers. And currently, he is pursuing his PhD in Christian Clinical Counseling in AGST, together with his wife, uh, Jervilyn. Uh, they, they serve as lead pastors of Trinity Christian Fellowship. They are blessed with two wonderful children, Daryl and Gadiel. And without further ado, let us all welcome Pastor Dave. Good morning. It's a joy to be able to fellowship with all of you. Um, almost half my life, my lifetime ago, I left BSOP 
and um, my heart was filled with excitement to serve the Lord. But um, one thing memorable about BSOP is because um, I remember that one moment where the Lord led me to a prayer room. Um, during the time, uh, we were living in a wooden dorm, and there was a small room allotted for prayer. And uh, the dorm was wooden, really. I remember that uh, there was a time where there was a fire just beside, over the fence, and um, all of us were afraid because uh, the fire was strong and so hot that um, if it was not controlled, the wooden dorm would be also set on fire. But we thank the Lord for preserving and nothing happened. But it was that one um, late afternoon that the Lord led me to that prayer room. And um, for some reason, I cannot understand the presence of God was so strong. Even though it was raining so hard, the storm was um, very, very, uh, the wind was strong outside. But inside that room, it was so calm. And it was there that the Lord revealed his plans for me. And that has set um, the direction of my ministry ever since. And so the reason why this OP is memorable, because it was a place where I encountered the Lord and received God's vision and direction for whatever ministry he has prepared for us, for me, rather. And so I would like to start off with a question, um, which, um, let me share the screen. What distinguishes you as a person? In other words, how would you describe yourself if given the opportunity or the chance? You now, many times uh, we'd like to be introduced with all our accomplishment and achievement. And honestly, uh, I'm a very private person and I'm not really... Um, comfortable of people introducing um, many things about me. And so normally, if given the chance and somebody would ask me how I will be introduced, I would like to simply be introduced as a pastor. In fact, uh, in church, I set a rule for the leaders not to call me reverend, doctor, or not even to elaborate any other background or titles, but just to be addressed as pastor. Because for me, being a pastor is my call. Reverend is title, but pastor is the call of God in, our, in my life. And I believe that um, for many of us, the same is true. We have a call from the Lord. And that's why I would like us to um, focus on the call that God has for us. Because the call of God is the identity that God has placed in our life. The moment we forget the call of the Lord, we also forget who we are. And we begin to strive we begin to labor, we begin to do things, and sad to say sometimes we miss out on what is important. And so that's why Romans chapter 1 verse 1 is a wonderful introduction because Paul introduced himself in, in a very simple yet very clear way. He introduced who he is, what his identity is. And he said, Paul, a servant of Christ, Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. So Paul introduced himself three things, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, Satan would like to always disturb us and even distract us from God's call in our life. And so I would like to make um, the message this morning a little bit lighter and hopefully a, a little fun because I'm a very serious person. But yet at the same time, my prayer is that the message will be spirit guided and spirit led so that we can receive whatever the Lord has prepared for us this morning. And so there are three pickup lines that I would like to share with you. Satan's pickup line. First, the challenge of the enemy is who do you think you are? As we try to serve the Lord, we always encounter this struggle in our heart, this challenge that the enemy throws. Who do you think you are? What can you do? This is a line of accusation. But whenever we encounter pickup lines, we should know what lines to throw. And so this is my proposal. Our response should be, it is not who I am, but whose I am that matter. 
You see, many times we're so concerned with who we are. And who we are are rooted or are based on our degree, our accomplishment. You know, it's so sad because even here in Negros, whenever I visit um, pastors, especially in remote places, you know, it's, there's no difference because whenever pastors who don't know each other would meet together, there are three questions that they would ask. Number one, what degree have you finished? Number two, how big is your congregation? And if they have the, the guts to ask, they will ask, how big is your salary? So it's all about figure. The bigger the figure is or the bigger the degree is, then the bigger you are as a person. However, many times we forget that it is not who we are, but it is who we belong to that really matter. In fact, our identity is not based on who we are. The Bible always reminds us that our identity is based on who Jesus is. That's why Paul, uh, Peter rather reminded us in 2 Peter chapter 1, he said his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness. Through this, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desire. If we are not guarded, if we are so conscious of our image, then we are easily swayed by the evil desires inside us. And to continue... Peter said, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I like the two words. We need to be effective and productive at the same time. Verse 9, but if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sin. And so in verse 10, therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, this is a very interesting animal. It's called an, an African impala. And what is unique about this animal is that it is said that it is able to jump to a height of over 10 feet and cover a distance greater than 30 feet. However, despite the strength of this animal, they can be kept inside a zoo with only a three foot tall, three feet tall wall. And the reason for this is this animal will not jump if they cannot see where their feet will land or fall. And so many times as Christians, we are like that. We, we don't move by faith, but we live by sight. If we cannot see where we are going, we refuse to go. And so may it be that the Lord will help us remember that many things that he wants us to do cannot be done by what we see and what we know. Many times the Lord would challenge our faith and cause us to go out of our comfort zone in order for us to be able to do the things that he would like us to do. And for us to be able to do that, we always need, always need to remember that we are secured in Christ. Our security is found in Jesus Christ alone. The second challenge that the enemy would throw to us is that we are not enough. It is a line of intimidation. No matter how much you try, it will never be enough. You know, growing up as a Chinese, we have a, a lot of wonderful culture. We are filled with, filled with rich culture, practices, moral values that are wonderful. But one of the things probably, um, especially in the, um, those of us who grew up in traditional Chinese home, one of the things that we observe probably is that we are not, we are not good in, a, in giving appreciation or we are not quick in giving affirmation. Um, whenever, most of the time, whenever our parents would call our attention, it's about something that we have failed or we have not done well. And so 
sometimes we grew up thinking that we, whatever we do, it is never enough. And that's the same thing. That's what the enemy would like to throw at us. No matter what we do for the Lord, it will never be enough. It's a line of intimidation that would cause us um, to, to, to be discouraged and to just simply give in. But whenever we encounter this lie from the enemy, how do we respond? I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Yes, I may not be enough, but with Christ in me, I can do all things. So have you heard of the following? A deaf composing great music. A blind writing beautiful hymn. A politician without, without arms and leg. Prisoners writing great literature and poems. Well, the truth is all of them are real people. Handel wrote the best music after his doctor told him he was going to die. Beethoven made his after he became totally blind. Homer, Milton, and Dante, the world's three greatest poets, were blind. And so was the great hymn writer Fanny Crosby. Full-time parliamentary, parliamentarian Lord Cavano had no arms or legs. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress in prison. And so did Martin Luther when he, he translated the Bible. So many times we are limited by what we feel, what we see, by our circumstances. But we need to always remember that God can go beyond and do greater things than what limits us, than the circumstances that we are in. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, we are reminded that the Bible says God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I believe that this verse speaks more than just resemblance. But it talks, something, it talks about something so powerful that if only man did not fall into sin, his very presence is a threat to the enemy. You know, that's why Satan was, was, was so, so passionate in wanting man to fall from the grace of God is because every time Satan looks at Adam, he is reminded of God and his, and his um, failure to, to, to usurp the throne of God. And so we are created in the image of God. And so we have the potential that God has given us. And sadly, because of the fall, we are very much limited and crippled. But the Bible tells us because of the redemption of Jesus Christ on the cross, he has empowered us. His divine power has given us everything we need in life and godliness through our knowledge of him. The word there, everything we need in life and godliness. In other words, we have the resources we need and we can tap on these resources. And sadly, many Christians have forgotten that they can always go to God and whatever they need will be supplied for because the God who called us to do his work will sufficiently empower us and equip us with whatever we need. And therefore, we need to guard ourselves. We need to guard ourselves from pride Verse, and, and instead think of the ministry and the calling of God as a privilege. You know, I like Paul because it was said that as Paul grows older, more experienced, and have accomplished greater things, he become more humble. He began by saying he is the worst of the sinners. And he began to say he is the least of the saint. And then finally he said, of all the apostles, he is the very least. And so we can see the progression that the more God used Paul, the more humble he become. Because you always remember that it is not his, um, his knowledge, it is not his ability, but it is always the grace of God that, 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 that was at work in his life. And so we need to always remember we are sufficient in Jesus Christ. On our own, we are filled with limitations and weaknesses. On our own, there are things that we cannot do or accomplish. But we always thank the Lord because 
in him we are sufficient. And the third pickup line, you are useless. This is a line of condemnation from the enemy. The enemy would like to always make us think that we are useless. But whenever we encounter this line, we can respond by saying, I'm too blessed to be depressed. Now, people who feel useless can easily fall into depression because they feel wor worthless. And that's exactly what the enemy would like us to think. We are worthless. We are useless. But God is with us. And as, as, the, as God's children, we are blessed beyond measure. And therefore, there's no room for us to give in to depression. Let me share a little of my testimony. After serving 10 years as associate pastor um, in the Chinese church, in Bacolod Trinity Christian Church, uh, the Lord led me and my wife to focus on the daughter church, which during that time was a small congregation of around 50 to 60 people, primarily student. I think 99% uh, were student. And so it was a very challenging step of faith for us. And um, we decided um, so that there will be no conflict of interest. Um, I decided to resign from the church in order to pastor this small, small congregation. Um, and on top of that, the Lord challenged us by, by, by speaking to us saying, if indeed you're serious in following me and my plans for you, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to cut off the reproach of Egypt. I was turning 40 during the time and I remember that Moses um, have led the Israel life of so I Egypt and the Lord was saying, I want you to give up whatever you are trusting and, and, and is holding you back from taking the step of faith. And after we prayed, my wife and I agreed it was our savings. So in being in a Chinese church, you know, sometimes we receive ang paus and um, being Chinese, we like to save. And so we have saved uh, for the past 10 years through the ang paus um, in order to uh, prepare for the future of our children, their education one day, so on and so forth. And the Lord was telling us that is the very thing that you're holding on. It is the very thing that you will look back when times get tough. And so when you say you want to follow me by faith, then you have to be willing to give up whatever you're holding on to. It was a difficult challenge for us to do. But um, after much prayer together with my wife, uh, we agreed to do that. In fact, the Lord gave my wife a dream. She dreamt that um, there was a coffin in front and our whole family was crying. And she was wondering who passed away in that dream. And so as she approached the coffin, it was a bit funny, but uh, interesting. Uh, she saw our past book. So um, the, the amount that God wanted us to give up was in time deposit. And it's going to mature in a month or two. And so literally that Sunday, we gave our offering in the form of a past book to the church. And um, only when it became mature, we encashed it and turned it over to the church. But that was a very difficult moment because it was a step of faith and it means that it will leave us with nothing. In fact, when we share this with our children, our, our, our son was okay, but our daughter, who was six years old, asked a very interesting question. She said, Dad, Mom, where will we get money to buy our groceries tomorrow? And my wife looked at her and said, no, God will provide. But of course, it was a step of faith. But we thank the Lord that God did amazing things. And um, the small congregation of around 50, 60 students, um, which of around 10,000 and sometimes 12,000, 12, the rental monthly was 15,000. So we were able to rent a small place to start the ministry to do equipping and training. And with the seed money that we offered, we began to do the ministry and um, plan intentionally how to equip the church. But we praise the Lord because 
we only stayed in this place for one year because after that, the Lord led us to a bigger place where we are right now. And um, as the church continued to grow, indeed, I can say it is nothing of what we have done, but it's all about the grace of God. You see, it started with that little act of faith that, that really um, multiplied to the lives of other people. You know, even without people knowing what we did, because the Lord asked us to keep it a secret for two years until he released us to share our testimony, the giving of the church also increases and the passion of the people also increases, increased. So it was amazing how the Lord began to work in our midst. And um, even in the midst of this pandemic, we can see, still see the Lord moving because without, you know, it's difficult actually to set goals right now as a church to say that by this time, we want to have this number of people. By this time, we want to have this number of life group. But the Lord is amazing because in the midst of pandemic, the ministry continues um, naturally, organically, and we begin to we we hear people um, starting small groups, starting life group. In fact, without the campus ministry right now, we hear people starting what they term community life group. They go into communities and start life group within certain areas. And another testimony: six months after, um, we we were told because sometimes the church would change the policy. And so we were told that um, whenever we will use the car vehicle, we need to ask permission. And it's a bit difficult sometimes because I was thinking uh, um, there are times I need to bring my children to school early in the morning at six o'clock. So it's uh, difficult to ask permission at six o'clock in the morning, but the Lord is good. Before we were told of this change of policy, so somebody met with us and handed us a key. It's a key to our first car. And, and the Lord was telling us, if you have doubt that this is from you, then uh, look at the plate number. Because in the church, all of the services are L300. In order to differentiate the, the cars, they would uh, call it by the number. So what I've been using for the past 10 years is 249 because that's the number of the car. But uh, God is so amazing that he reminded us that he is a God who is able to provide what is needed. And so I, I told the, the board representative that time who told us we need to ask permission. I told, I told them that uh, there, I, I would like to ask a, a permission, but it's not about the using of the car. I would like to ask permission about parking a car. <laughs> and they were surprised, uh, but uh, they were happy for us because uh, they have seen the goodness of the Lord. And in fact, throughout the 10 years, God has been good because this little church um, composed of um, um, ordinary people, there are, no, um, there are no millionaires, no, no great businessmen. Most of the people in church that I'm handling are people who are, who are just turning professional. Some have just started work. Some are working online, mostly are students. But um, God has been good because throughout the 10 years, he has provided everything we need. And now God is challenging us even to do something that, is, that would stretch our faith. God has led us to secure a land in the mountain in order to come up with this hope center. What is this hope center? It is house of prayer and equipping. And so God is continually stretching our faith in order for us to be able to equip people in the area of prayer. And so God has also allowed us to produce material. All of these are unplanned. It's all by the grace of God. And that's why we are reminded that everything that the Lord would like us to do, we are able to do, not by our own strength, but by his grace and his wisdom alone. And that's why verse four again says, through this, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desire. Now, the enemy would like to pull us away from God's plan and purpose, but God always brings us back to his call. And as, as God's servant, we always have to remember what God's call in our lives is. 
you know, it is not what we accomplish that will ultimately determine our identity. Because no matter what a person has accomplished, they're deep inside us, there's always that sense that it's never enough. It's like you always have to do more. You always have to perform more. But when we know that our identity is rooted in Christ, then we know that we are serving an audience of one. Ultimately, people can give their comment because no matter how successful a person is, there will always be both positive and negative comment. But whenever we always, whenever we spend time with the Lord, we are always affirmed of who we are. More than just serving the Lord, being a servant of God, we are children of God. Sonship before servanthood. We are God's children. And we go to God, not as slaves. We go to God as our father who knows our need, who loves us, who cares for us, and who is able to supply everything we need. He is a God who doesn't assign us to do something and expect us to fail. He is a God who assigns us to do something and is excited for us to accomplish that by his grace and by his strength. And so Peter said, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Paul, Peter is saying, build on your character. Because if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we lose sight of our character and instead focus on our credibility, then we begin to become ineffective and unproductive. One person said, when character is lost, everything is lost. And Paul said, and Peter said, but if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sin. And therefore, we need to guard ourselves. We build on our character rather than our credential. I recognize that credential is important. I said that I'm not comfortable being introduced with all the credential, but I realized there are times that it is necessary. Um, one time uh, when I went to the southern part um, of Negros to meet with the pastors, um, I was asked how, how should I be introduced? And I politely told them, I prefer to be introduced just a pastor who loved the Lord, who served the Lord, and who wants others to love him. And um, the person who was asking me, also polite, politely told me, but frankly told me, um, Pastor, that's good. However, in our place, that would not bring the pastors in because they look after credential. And so I have no choice, but uh, I have to give in. You see, we're living in a world where people look at credential. But after all the credentials, at the end, what will keep our credibility as a pastor as a servant of the Lord, is our character. People ultimately will not follow us or will not measure us according to our credential. People will follow us and measure us according to our character. And we should exhibit the character of Christ in our life. So we need to remember that we are set apart. We are sanctified in Christ. So we are no longer the same person we were. But we are now people whom God has called and set apart for his purpose. We are no longer living for ourselves. And I believe that as pastors and as God's servant, there will always be opportunities ahead. You know, when I decided to pastor this small church, you know, one of the person in my life that got so worried was my mom. We know, well, we know that um, people said that if you are a pastor in a Chinese church, then you are able to live comfortably, okay. But um, if you are not pastoring a Chinese church, then there will be much struggle going on. And so she was, the first thing she asked me when I said, uh, I'm resigning and I'm going to pastor this small church. The first thing she asked me is, how will you feed your family? But you know, after 10 years, uh, she has seen the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God, how God did miracles after miracles how God has provided uh, one after the other. And there's so much miracles that 
it's it's um it's almost impossible to doubt the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. You know, we have been set apart. And when the Lord set us apart, he also equipped us for what we need to do his work. And finally, the third pickup line, have I got a deal for you? It is a line of temptation. Satan would like to offer good things. And in fact, when Satan tried to tempt Jesus, he was not off tempting Jesus with bad things. He knows that Jesus was hungry. And so he tempted Jesus by turning the stone to bread. He tempted Jesus to become famous. He tempted Jesus to go the easy way. And so in the same way, Satan would like to offer us deals. You know, you want, you want your dream to happen, you do this. Or he would bring in a better offer to distract us from the work of God. You know, so throughout the years of pastoring, there are offers that has been coming as well. And um, there are offers that would, um, would um, uh, offers that is twice what I'm receiving. And recently, three times what I'm receiving. And it's very tempting. We could always say, we're still in the call of God. We're still pastoring anyway. But then I realized that to be in God's call means you have to be the right person in the right place in the right time. If we are not in the right place or in the place where God wants us to be, then we are not in the call of God. So being sanctified and being set apart, our life is no longer our own. We no longer think which is convenient, which is better, which is a greener pasture, but rather we begin to think how our lives could best, be, could best serve our master. And so regardless what offers that you will be receiving in the future, spend time in prayer in seeking the Lord for whatever will that he has for us. I remember one time the Lord clearly told me, not all opportunities are from me. Not all opportunities are from me. Some of those opportunities may be good, but they are not from God. They are destruction from the enemy that will divert you from moving away from God's purpose for you. And so our response is, you're no big deal. Because I have the best deal in life. And of course, we know that the best deal is what God has for us. Because the Bible says, his plan is good, pleasing, and perfect. And so, therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, it's easy to fall for the applaud of men. But in the end, what we should be looking forward is the voice of our Savior saying, well done, good and faithful servant. And so therefore, we need to guard ourselves from entitlement. Entitlement will cause us to think that we deserve this, we deserve that. But a heart of gratitude will always cause us to remember that everything is by the grace of God and everything is because of God's love and goodness. You know, I may not have accepted a bigger pay offer, but God has been good because he has supplied us everything that we need. And, he, and to walk by faith and not by sight sometimes can be frightening, but it is a very exciting journey of knowing who God is for who he is. So. We may be doing the call, but we may not be in the call. So it's something that we need to always guard ourselves from. Because at the end of everything, we always remember that we are here serving the Lord. And it is the call of God in our lives that would sustain us, empower us, and allow us to fulfill and finish the race that God has given us. Let's pray. Lord, we come before your presence, O oh God, and we acknowledge our weaknesses and our limitation, O oh God. We know that there's so little that we can do and so much that we cannot do. We acknowledge that it is by your grace, 
your grace alone that we can see your plans, your purposes, and your work accomplished through us and in our lives. And today, Lord, we come before you, O God, and we surrender ourselves to you. We thank you for the call that you have in our lives because this call is irrevocable. And we thank you because with this call comes privileges, but also comes the burden and the challenges that we need to face. And by your grace and your grace alone, sustain us so that at the end of our lives, we would hear your sweet voice telling us, well done, good and faithful servant. May we work not for the applaud of men, but may we work for the glory of God. We thank you and may all, all glory be yours and yours alone. In Jesus' name, amen.